In this last video for the screen side chat, I'm going to address a couple questions that I think are kind of related um, and concern, you know, public goods and uh, value of resources. Um, the first question was by uh, Shirley, and she asked, what does Stanford University offer that is unique that no one else can provide? And I, I asked this in the, the lecture, and I, I wasn't trying to be too controversial with that. What I was kind of asking was, uh, what is the kind of valued resource that Stanford affords? What What is the resource we have? And I think a lot of you mentioned, you know, feasible answers, which are, you know, we have a credential, uh, a degree, uh, prestige. I mean, it, it's an elite institution in many ways. Uh, uh, we have networks, contacts that are feasible through this institution. Um, and we have expertise, knowledge, right? So all of those things fit. Um, and then others mentioned a culture, it, you know, it's distinct as a culture, it's very entrepreneurial and open here. Uh, and so it's kind of unique in that way, but, you know, asking whether those are, are resources that are unique to Stanford, do we have a monopoly on those? No. Um, and moreover, I think what I was kind of, maybe I was trying to uh, imply, and I think Wendy Nye does a good job in her comments, uh, her, her post of picking up on this, that the creation of online courses, um, particularly with the inventor, the Stanford inventors of uh, Coursera, um, this has created a whole set of issues about changing value in these features. It's feasible in a short time here that credentials will be given online, um, that the funding from teaching uh, will disappear, um, that we can provide this knowledge freely and um, in many ways, even the kind of uh, advanced pedagogical kinds of efforts like group work or projects could be implemented on the site. And moreover, worries about cheating could be also uh, checked very easily with, you know, uh, these videos right in front of us uh, that, that catch us, whether we would have facial recognition or whatever. So all of this is, is feasible and it's, it's coming and it's, it's challenging the or altering the value of the resources that the university is based upon. Um, and there's a lot of unknowns about this. Like, uh, we don't know uh, whether offering away all this uh, undermines the value of the resource, right? Um, and we're trying to explore it. And I think uh, there are also some interesting dependence relations that occur. Coursera is a private company, and the university here created a, a new platform internally called class to go uh, which you can look up, and they have a, a couple courses there, and they're going to expand it. And if you think about why they did that, I, I think it is a resource dependence argument that uh, if all these universities, if there is no other platform, if, if or if it's centralized on one, um, then uh, the dependence on this is problematic for the university that uh, we would give up our intellectual property and the like. Moreover, it kind of hinders uh, competition to have no other platforms. So. That's a problem, and it's a non-profit class to go, as whereas Coursera is a private for-profit. So, I mean, there are differences, and I'm not fully sure how it's all working out, but it's clear that the, the creation of this uh, internal one, class to go, is a concern about dependence. Um, there are contracts between the university and Coursera in terms of knowledge and sharing, and it's very interesting. And uh, in terms of who owns the data of this course, uh, Stanford owns my course, and uh, arguably, if I ever went to Google or a for-profit, that I would lose rights to all of this material, that Stanford would retain it. Or if I go to another non-profit, uh, like, uh, I don't know, Princeton, I would, I would keep the course with me. So there are various kinds of scenarios here about who owns the resource and what, what its value is according to how much you allow it to go out in the world. Um, I think in many ways by... Uh, being involved in this process and being inventors of it, and, and in my case, we're, we're kind of trying to push the envelope in terms of adapting the technology so it gets closer to this sharing. Um, I think it is shifting the where the resource values and the, res uh, the university will, will reside. We're, we would give away the public good would be the knowledge itself, um, and the returns would be to the reputation of the university as a nonprofit for the public good, and that's what it's supposed to be, right? Uh, and that by sharing that, maybe the, the internal activity will focus more on research, the interactions there with my students and with people face-to-face, -face, um, and the teaching could be done in this kind of way, in a more economical way, uh, that would afford more access.
So yeah, I do think it also fits uh, Stanford's culture to actually do this. Um, but we're all trying to figure out what it means, and, and I'll talk more about this in the course as we go along, like week nine. Uh, it'll be clear that this challenges the legitimacy of what a higher institution of, of education is and what it has to convey and whether a classroom has to be the way to do things or if there are, there are other means. And some of us are very open about exploring that, and that's what you're seeing with these kinds of platforms. Um, and I think that Stanford's very open and willing to work with both Coursera or uh, other platforms that they create themselves. So you're going to see that too. Um, the second question was, uh, is there a danger? I think it's actually related to the, the one, the first one about Stanford and Coursera a little bit, which is, are there dangers of holding on to a scarce resource? And when does it become advisable to share it? And this was one Lottie posted, and, and she meant it with regard to oil. And I know others of you talked about uh, oil, uh, water as related. But I think even knowledge, I mean, universities have become very expensive. And uh, knowledge has become this scarce resource, or credentials have become a scarce resource. Um, there are all kinds of things that will get affected as more and more people probably get a credential through these means, and maybe of equal quality eventually, or even 50% the equality for a fraction of the cost. Uh, that's that's going to change things, and it'll be interesting to see how that that pans out. Uh, is it advisable? Um, well, so we, we had a, a series of things about when it's advisable to share, and I, I or when is it advisable to to not monopolize a resource? And I think uh, you know some of you talked about this, and it's an issue of business ethics to some extent. Uh, and I mentioned that in an earlier screenside chat of a couple weeks ago. But I, I think it's also one of balancing multiple resource uh, needs. You know, money is just one resource, but there are others like knowledge, but also goodwill and trust. And, uh, you know, when it comes to geopolitics, if you hoard oil or, or water, that can lead to other kinds of problems or other costs on other dimensions of value and resources. So I think uh, you have to think of it as more multidimensional in terms of what's going on. There are multiple resources uh, being exchanged and used here. Um, and moreover, the value of any particular resource within these institutions is shifting. Like I said, with the advent of Coursera, I think you will see things shift uh, in terms of what is considered a monetary value. Um, and I, I like Michael's example that he related about rattling saber and he he said American Airlines had a, a proprietary reservation software program that it had decided to allow its competitors to use. So it became an industry standard, and American maintained an advantage based on its superior ability to use the software. So what was nice about this in some ways is it's kind of reflective of Stanford's effort to do these online courses. I, again, one thing to keep in mind is I am not officially... This is not an official Stanford course. It's a course um, from me. And uh, Stanford's not, uh, until it's credentialed, they will not uh, claim it in some ways in terms of value and attributions of credit. It's indirectly so through someone like me who's affiliated with the university. But I think the point of Michael is nice in that uh, by doing this kind of resource to the world, we. We actually have a, a, a leg up for, for ourselves in changing this landscape and the dependencies in it and making sure that, that maybe we're on the forefront of it. So I think there's something to that. And I, I really thought that was a nice insight or comparison. Um, but I ultimately, I think value is something pretty hard to attribute. And uh, you know Tara picked up on this in my lectures. And it's mostly because there's so many different things that we can regard as valuable um, and on different dimensions. Uh, there are other things that people could do to share resources, too, um, that are like these uh, in, um, alliances that Lottie mentioned in, in her own work on uh, natural parks. But I, I think there's uh, other ways in which you can share uh, resources and have a, an outlook for the public good. And one of the things that I've noticed is an increase in these investment portfolios uh, that individuals have and companies have that have ethics tied to them. Um, but you also see companies like Google that try to make sure that, that uh, their practices are consistent with their motto and, and mission. Uh, so it's kind of a blending of nonprofit with profit kinds of concerns with the public good and collective value. And I, I think there's something to the, the argument that a collective good and a collective value 
may not necessarily be the, the, the same as the value a firm gets out of something, uh, the same concerns of exchange and resources there. So there is some kind of potential for uh, a problem since you have to think about which organizations actually look out for the collective good and the collective values and share resources. And those tend to be governments uh, for the people, hopefully, and then also uh, for their citizens, but then also uh, nonprofit organizations that because of their nonprofit status and notice that regulations allow them to have that status and to function as such in so long as they share things. Uh, and so I think uh, you, you do see that kind of in place within our societies as a kind of organization that, that's supposedly looking out uh, for efforts to share. Um, so that's my answer to those kinds of questions. Uh, I look forward to next week. It'll be Network Forms of Organization and kind of an extension of this week uh, in many ways. And I look forward to seeing you on the forum.